one of the greatest concerns in modern modern philosophy, at least in the public sphere, maybe not so much in the <clears throat> academic realm, but in the public sphere, in the public discussion of philosophy, one of the main concerns is whether humans are blank slates and the degree to which our behavior is predetermined. Um, so it seems that there certainly has been movements. There have been movements that seek to completely avoid uh, any investigation into what humans come to the world already possessing. So if we look at the behaviorists in psychology, they, at the outset of their research, uh, rejected investigating the internal workings of the mind. And they certainly were not going to draw uh, causal relationships between the evolutionary environment of our ancestors and the internal mental states and behavioral motivations of humans, of people. <laughs> but it just is not possible to fully understand psychology or even begin to understand an individual psychology if we are only allowed to use behaviorist tools. It, we're blinding ourselves and tying our hands behind our back if we refuse to acknowledge the internal mental state uh, of a person or of humans if we're understanding the human mind in general. So, <clears throat> I think <clears throat> that Jung, in a way, he at least in the realm of clinical psychology introduced essentially the idea of humans coming to the world pre-programmed with a certain set of potential uh, attitudes and behavioral patterns and he called those preset uh, attitudes and patterns, archetypes. So I think really where he's coming from there is that he distinguishes himself from Freud because Freud thought the unconscious was totally personal, as in it was throughout the process of development that certain conscious experiences are offloaded to the unconscious because they just can't be... They are obstacles. It's the path of least resistance is for consciousness to simply neglect those problems for the time being and pass them off to the unconscious. Uh, so Freud saw the unconscious as, at the moment of birth, being essentially empty, or <coughs> there's a, well, filled with passions, but uh, I suppose Freud would say that we are we come built in with passions. You know, the id is there. Uh, and it predisposes us to certain behavior, but he doesn't really go into what is in there. He says that some he re reduces it to sexuality, but in a lot of ways, uh, for Freud, his whole method, his whole psychoanalytic method, is to interrogate his his patients and determine what events in their in their childhood, in particular, or at least throughout their life, uh, were problem events that they couldn't resolve and which resulted in an unconscious and which resulted in them pushing those problems below the level of consciousness. The point is that his method didn't involve um, <clears throat> a, dis a, a discussion with the client of their pre-existing motivations and what they're going to do with them. The method was to identify the sticking point with the patient and then to express whatever locked up emotional energy 
uh, had, had been had stored. Jung, on the other hand, instead of just digging through the personal unconscious of his patient and finding uh, complexes filled with emotions that um, that needed to be discussed and expressed and resolved, and a certain amount of catharsis is also part of the treatment there, just expressing those uh, pent-up emotions can deflate the energy. And, uh, when the when the complex, when the neurosis and the Freudian idea, Freudian sense, uh, is deflated of its pent-up psychic tension, uh, it can often be much easier to resolve those problems. So it's just a matter of bringing them up from the unconscious, the personal unconscious, that is, and expressing them. Uh, Jung, on the other hand, he noticed that there was an issue where... Um, it wasn't so much that his clients had had traumatic experiences from which they had not been able to recover, but that they simply didn't know what to do with their inbuilt behavioral uh, intuitions. So what Jung would say is that we come to the world with these archetypal predispositions. We come to the world and we expect to find a mother and a father. And... We expect to speak to each other, and we expect to have have friends, and to have uh, sexual and romantic relationships, and we expect to do a lot of things. We come to the world with a lot of presuppositions. We expect, for instance, to, to experience violence and to have to defend ourselves. We come built in with a fight-or-flight defense system. So what Jung says is that those, those built-in uh, patterns and uh, predilections reach right up into our psyche. It's not just a matter of we come built in with a with a system that where our stomach signals to our brain that it's empty when it needs to be fed <clears throat> and filled with nutrients. It's not that's not the only uh, biological presupposition we have. To Jung, we have other presuppositions. For instance, he would say that we interpret our unconscious as as evil, as dark, and as being filled with uh, negativity. Uh, at least at the first stage of psychological development. Uh, that is a biological... Uh, determinant of behavior. Now, what you would say is that the process of, of, of psychological development is taking these inbuilt predilections and developing them. So, uh, finding ways of expressing them, which are, first of all, mutually coherent. So, we need to be able to express our inbuilt predilection for rage and anger at the same time as we express our inbuilt predilection for social harmony and also for say sexual relationship we need to be able to satisfy all of our different motivations at the same time so it's not simply going to be enough if we can satisfy one biological determinant at the expense of all the others we have to do all of them at once but at the same time we have to we're not going to be able to satisfy any of our uh, inbuilt uh, predetermined desires in isolation. We have to do it in the context of a society. So we have to not only uh, figure out how to <clears throat> express each of our inbuilt motivations in a way that doesn't detract from the expression of another of our inbuilt motivations, we have to do that, we have to have the same respect towards other people, because we're unable to satisfy, at least to the great, to the, to the maximum of our ability, our inbuilt biological uh, disposition, without the help of others. And to add just a, one further level of difficulty, we also have to consider across, across quite a wide uh, 
span of time. We live quite long lives, humans. And so we have to find a way of expressing and developing our inbuilt predilections given to us by our biology in a way that doesn't contradict with our other predilections and in a way that doesn't contradict with our fellow men's predilections and in a way that doesn't contradict over a long period of time. So then for Jung, the psychological, the process of psychological development and also the process of <coughs> uh, therapy is to find ways of, of expressing these fundamental motivations in a way that doesn't contradict each other and doesn't contradict the motivations of others and doesn't contradict itself over time. <coughs> now, if we just take a Freudian approach or we take another approach, like a postmodern approach, where we, if we were to reduce all suppositions of biological determinism or biological predilection, if we reject all of those purely as being uh, cultural narratives and biopower, uh, what we end up with is no, we are, we are at the outset unable, if it is true that we come to the world built in with certain uh, predilections, if that is the case, which seems quite reasonable, even though you may doubt it, that it may well be the case at least, then taking an attitude where we, we reject all hypotheses of built-in predilections at the outset because we consider them potentially biopower. We consider them potentially lies, discourses meant to reinforce traditional notions. If we do that, we completely hamstring psychology. The whole purpose, at least from a Jungian perspective, is to find out how we can organize uh, the different parts of the mind and the different parts of society across time so that we can live in a productive, harmonious way. So if we reject any theory that could possibly do that, we're obviously throwing out the potential for, I would say, we're throwing out the potential for harmonious society. Um, I don't want to get too far into the postmodern aspect, but it seems to me that the attitude, the attitude at least to say the Hegelian, uh, those of the postmodernists who have a Hegelian persuasion, I think that their attitude is that by gradually cutting away all of the flaws in society, we can allow the natural, organic, uh, organizational force uh, to express itself and we'll gradually move towards the greater system. That's a Hegelian dialectical history. Uh, so there's a sort of certain faith that if we can just continue the process of cutting away there's a faith within the postmodern mindset, I believe, or at least within those postmodernists who do follow Hegel, in that their faith is that if we can just gradually cut away all of the problems with society, it will naturally develop and, and head towards the greatest possible system. However, I think that's flawed because it passes the buck of social organization and development to history it's saying that the development is inevitable so if we just let the historical process happen uh it, society will become will gradually attain to its highest perfection but to me that's impossible because i feel that society improves not simply by cutting away its its flaws but by great people dedicating themselves to enhancing and enriching it. Um, <clears throat> so Jung's project would be to take uh, individuals 
and all of their confused interests and all their confused relationships and all of their confused plans for the future and try and make them coherent in a way that satisfied all of the realms of interest. Time, others, and uh, the internal workings of their mind. From the postmodern perspective, that is not um, that is not the method. So I think what the difference here is that Jung would suggest that the only way forward is for us to address the fundamental problem of our inbuilt desires, and and just do the hard work of figuring out how to express those desires in a way that doesn't conflict with our other desires or other people or other times. Uh, and if we don't do that, then there's no chance of a flourishing society. We have to actually push up. We have to take something that is basic and f and give shape to it and sculpt it and, and test it and, and see how we can express it in a way that is good uh, and has good results. Uh, which is just difficult and effortful and requires attention and intention uh, and responsibility. The Hegelian attitude of dialectic, where history simply progresses by itself automatically, and that we don't really have to intervene in any way because if something bad happens, like Hitler is just a stepping stone on the way to the to the highest, highest, most perfect society, because the dialectic progresses inevitably; it cannot be stopped. So for me, I feel that. Whatever our description is, it's a it's a it's a reductio ad absurdum. If your philosophy uh, tries to aims, if your philosophy aims at the improvement of society, but disallows for the one thing that that gives rise to the improvement of society, it seems to me that philosophy has that philosophy has reached a reductio ad absurdum. I think the Jungian attitude has potential. Now, it's probably not the be-all, end-all, but it, it, it involves effort. I don't think that we're ever going to escape the difficulties of a disharmonious world of people and disharmonious minds of individuals we're never going to resolve that unless individuals actually put in the work to make these things better to find better ways of organization we can't simply let it, let, leave it to history to develop organically the part of organic organic historical development is not uh, well, I believe, in fact, that the development of society produced by great people uh, doing their work, doing their best, taking responsibility and trying to envisage a better world, that is the way that society organically develops. This negative attitude, negative in the sense of we just chop away the problems, and allow the good to flourish. It's too... It, it passes the buck of growth over to nature or to history. In any, in any case, it passes the buck over to something which we cannot control. So it's, it's a desirable philosophy because it takes people off the hook. No longer are we responsible for... Uh, disharmonious society. Uh, no longer are we responsible for making things better because history does that and we cannot control history. So for me, um, that's a nihilistic attitude and the Jungian attitude is the exact opposite. The difficulty is that it requires responsibility. It requires that we actually look at what is difficult and do the work of making it better. Uh, and of course that's unpleasant because it means that we have to accept that 
the only way that we are going to go forward is if we continuously <clears throat> continuously take what we are, what we came to the world with, and we try and transform it, which is painful. If that's, if that's going to be our lot, a lot of people want to avoid that. So they come to this Hegelian dialectical uh, perspective where they pass the buck of development over to something over which they have no control. And thus they avoid the pain of knowing that they are personally responsible for organizing themselves and their lives and their relationships and their society.